<laughs> so uh, thank you, Dr. Hanapi, for this kind invitation and uh, this opportunity to be with you. Uh, in the interest of time, I will go directly to the topic of my uh, presentation. Uh, I have put this sort of somewhat long and perhaps a little complicated uh, title here because there are two very sort of key concepts that I'm trying to capture and, and talk about in my talk. Uh, the concept of political spirituality and uh, the concept of the decline of uh, community. So I will be talking a little bit about each one of them as we move on, but let me just give a start with sort of uh, <clears throat> background information. So uh, many of you know about the 1979 Islamic Revolution, either through, uh, if you have watched the news yesterday, then you have learned something about it. Uh, Iran is always on the news, mostly for uh, the wrong reasons. But uh, uh, for those of you who uh, don't know much about the background of this uh, revolution, it happened in 1979. Nine and it was labeled Islamic Revolution. And that was sort of a surprise to many observers of uh, the social trends in Iran because it happened after almost sort of five decades, six decades of heavy secularization in the country and modernization of the country and industrialization. So it uh, came as a surprise to a lot of these observers and analysts of social trends that a society after such an intense period of uh, modernization has gone back to religion and has uh, launched sort of Islamic revolution. Uh, this was an issue for uh, pretty much all public intellectuals of the time, but it was particularly interesting for the French intellectuals. And there was sort of two, there were two reasons for this. One was sort of the kind of engagement that the French intellectuals uh, traditionally had with the world affairs and the interests that they had, but also because the leader of that revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, happened to be living in France, in, in suburbs of uh, Paris, in a place called Nouvelle le Chateau, and uh, he was basically leading the revolution from there. So it became, became kind of a part of the local news for, the, for many French. By the way, Aoun went first there, and then... Uh, uh... They have told that it's not a good idea, just so, so it's, it's a place of exile. All right, and uh, so uh, the discussions that happened around uh, this revolution that some at that time called the Islamic Revolution, some just the Iranian Revolution, uh, could be categorized uh, under sort of three broad uh, labels. One was. Uh, a kind of view that was mostly expressed in uh, Omanite, which was a newspaper that was published by uh, the French Communists, Communist League. And uh, they saw in that revolution a traditional, uh, a usual anti-imperialist uh, revolution, like the one in Vietnam, which uh, had a very sort of class uh, nature to it. And uh, it happened to be uh, led by a cleric, by an ayatollah, a religious man. So a lot of these people said that, well, it doesn't really matter what is the appearance of this uh, leader. What matters is that the ideas that he's using, the ideas that he's leading the re revolution with are the conventional uh, anti-imperialist, uh, conventional concepts that are used in an anti-imperialist uh, revolution. So that was one, uh, camp, one type of uh, perspective on the Iranian revolution. The second one, which was less concerned with this anti-imperialism, anti-colonial aspect of it, and was more looking at the internal dynamics and the kind of consequences that this revolution can have for different parts of society, especially for women. And uh, they knew that a lot of uh, traditional uh, religions have uh, a very sort of built-in patriarchal uh, structure to them, and therefore they were worried that this uh, revolution might result in all sorts of restrictions on on women. So this is uh, this was mostly 
uh, expressed by those who were writing in another French news, uh, newspaper, Liberation. So they believe that this is sort of a move back in a sense, uh, because when they when the religious people come to power, they will create another dictatorship and the most likely targets of that dictatorship are going to be women. Then a third view was mentioned by uh, Michel Foucault that, you know, the French uh, philosopher, uh, very influential and very controversial, uh, he saw something quite different. He didn't see any of these, uh, he, he saw elements of these perspectives, but he added something to it and created sort of a different uh, package and a different perspective. Uh, he felt that this is not just a political uh, development, this is also a philosophical moment. So it has a, an additional feature because at that time when the uh, Iranian revolution was happening, there were a couple of other revolutions underway in, in the world. The Sandinist uh, revolution in Nicaragua was happening in uh, uh, Mugabe, where is Mugabe? Uh, 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 no, at that time. Uh, he was uh, also leading the, he, him and Joshua and Komo were leading another revolution against the, the British. So there were, there were other revolutions that were happening, but they didn't attract too much uh, attention uh, by, by Foucault. It was Iran that sort of got, got, got his attention. And this is in this quote that I have from him. You can, you can see some of the elements that he was looking at. He says that this is a phenomenon that for our political mentality is very curious. A revolutionary movement in which one cannot situate the internal contradictions of a society and in which one cannot point out a vanguard either. So it was a revolution that uh, was characterized by the massive participation of people, which was true, it was, um, named as sort of the uh, revolution with the highest level of participation of masses in the 20th century. And also until very late in the revolutionary process, there was not really a leader that could be identified. It was Ayatollah Khomeini sort of became the leader of that revolution quite quite late. So maybe in the, in the last four or five months uh, before the victory of the revolution. So, and, and that was the time that Michel Foucault actually went to Iran he went to Iran twice in September and uh, October or November of 1978 to visit what was happening. And uh, the way that he has put it is that I could see that a new idea was being born and I wanted to be see to, to be there to see when when it is born, not to read about it in the in the books later on. So he went there and uh, wrote some reports for a couple of uh, newspapers. I guess uh, Corriere de la Serra was the one that uh, he was writing for at the time. Two things, uh, and he had some conversation with other French intellectuals, two things he highlighted about this revolution. And those are the ones that I will be uh, talking about. Uh, one, he says something sort of similar to uh, what was mentioned in the previous quote, nobody has ever seen the collective will. The collective will was like God, like the soul, like something one would never encounter. But we met in Tehran and throughout Iran, the collective will of a people. And so this massive participation of people in the revolution for, for him was a sign that there is such a thing as collective will. And collective will is not just an abstract concept like the soul of a nation. These are all very abstract concepts, but he had seen uh, in Iran a, a materialization, a manifestation of that, that abstract concept. I have uh, called that a community, and I will be talking about this aspect, so the communal aspect of uh, the Iranian revolution. Now, the second part, he said that people in Iran were saying, of course, that we have to change this regime. So that was the political part. But above all, we have to also we change, we have to change ourselves, our way of being, our relationship with others, with things, with eternity, with God. So again, that revolution had that political side, but it had something 
uh, extra and there was some sort of philosophical layer on top of that and that was about the way that Iranians saw themselves and the world around uh, around them he called this part the political spirituality so now you have these two concepts or, or even three concepts uh, to work with uh, unfortunately in the past 43 years uh, since the Iranian revolution, most of the attention uh, has gone to this last two words, to the political and to the spirituality. Most of the discussions, most of the contributions that you see have focused on either the religious part of uh, this movement or on the political side, especially the political part. And, Every discussion that uh, you hear uh, about Iran is either talking about the political implication of that for uh, region, political implication of that for the world order, and political uh, developments inside inside the country. And then, of course, there is that discussion about about religion, much much less than the political aspect. So, independently from Foucault is just by coincidence. I have written two books on these two aspects. The uh, one uh, is uh, this bottom one was published just a few months ago, Sacred as Secular Secularization Under Theocracy in Iran, which was is looking at sort of the changes, the religious changes in Iran in the past uh, almost 50 years. So I have tried to sort of uh, use whatever data was available from surveys and from uh, socialist uh, re pro projects that were done at the time to capture the essence of this development. So that's the part that I will not be talking about. I don't think we'll have time to go into that. But I will talk more about the, the first part, the communal part, which I think is the part that has been overlooked and uh, has been sort of pushed into the background and there is not a lot of discussion about it. And and every time that there is a discussion about it, it comes, it is understood with a lot of sort of, uh, in, in a very distorted way and uh, with false interpretation. So I want to sort of spend a little more time on that. So uh, for those of you who might be familiar with uh, a couple of concepts like social capital, for example, or community or trust. Uh, all of those concepts are relevant for the discussion that, that we have here. But let me start from this sort of bigger structure. Society can be, of course, uh, the structure, not the structure, we can understand society in so many different ways, depending on the purposes that we have. Here I have uh, portrayed the societal structure as a sort of a triangle influenced by Karl Pulny, uh, work on sort of market, state and community. And uh, I think that we can put the things that are happening in a society under these three very broad uh, categories, which of course have a lot of overlap with each other as well. But these the three different areas have their own different logics and have their own different functioning. And it is important, it is, it is useful to sort of separate things under these three uh, in order to be able to sort of uh, tackle each one of them uh, more effectively. One is market. Uh, or world economy, we can call it, uh, one state and one community. In market, uh, of course, uh, imagine when you go shopping. You go there and you find the thing that you need and you pay for it. And that is pretty much all the uh, activities that happen there. You go there with an interest that you have in mind. And the other party also has an interest, an interest in your money. And so basically you exchange those and that's the end of that, that process. So it is uh, the activities that happen there are based on the exchange of interests, exchange of benefits. 
And what you do when you are in the market, you try to minimize the cost that you are paying and maximize the benefit that you are getting. And the other party is doing the same thing. In a state, uh, it's power, it is rights that uh, are being contested and are being sort of uh, competed for. The state has uh, is, is a powerful player and because of that can, like, can limit your rights. And you as individuals are constantly sort of fighting, fighting back. So it is it is a fight that is going on there over over rights and over territories. In community, we have total, something totally different. For community, imagine your family. In a family, the logic of operation is very different from what is happening in the market and what's happening in, in the state. In your family, you care about the other members of the family. You help each other. You uh, like each other. Uh, and uh, anyone who has any resources available will make it available to the other members of the family. So the logic of uh, operation or the operating system in, in the community is based on uh, reciprocity, is based on caring, is based on kindness. So. Uh, uh, if if you bring the logic of market into the family, you will destroy the family. If you take the logic of family and take it to the market, you will destroy yourself in the market because it doesn't work like that. And the same the same with the state. So we have three different zones that each of them is operating with a different operating system. And because of this operating different operating system that they have, they are capable of doing certain things that the other uh, force or the other territory or the other operating system is not able to do. Uh, when you are in the market, when you are dealing with the state, you can never uh, find anyone who will sacrifice uh, his or her resources for you. But this can happen in the community. So all, all sorts of things. When, when you think about it this way, you will see, uh, you'll find lots of examples of this. All right. So. What are some of the uh, defining features of this, this communal life, this communal ties? Very quickly, I won't go into details of this, but I'm, and I'm sure these are all the stuff that you can think of, but just to put them in a specific word. So reciprocity, as I mentioned, you just exchange things in, the, uh, in this kind of communal environment and an imagined family always for the, uh, for, for the community, but, but you know that community is not reduced to family. We can uh, sort of have larger family, we can, with larger community, we can have a neighborhood, we can have a city, we can have uh, a nation. These are all different sizes of community. So reciprocity is something that is very dominant and uh, common there. There must be some resources that people exchange with each other through these connections. Uh, the fungibility of uh, services or favors that are being exchanged which means that they are, they can be translated to each other. You can, I can give you a pen, you can give me a, a bottle of water, for example. There are two different things, but these different things can be exchanged. Now, these are the, <coughs> these are the beautiful things about uh, the communal activities. Vague exchange rate, vague exchange rate should normally be something negative. Anything that is vague is, should not be good. But in this case, it is a good thing because when uh, there is a big exchange rate, if I uh, give you a pen and I get a bottle of water in return, I'm not quite sure if this is exactly, uh, this is worth exactly the same as that pen. And especially if you desperately need that pen, if I desperately need this water, then the value of this will be much higher than whatever you pay for it. So uh, people that are involved in this kind of transaction uh, can always feel that they haven't paid enough. They haven't returned the favor fully. And therefore they feel that they are in debt to someone. And both sides can, can feel this way. And when this happens, that basically means there is a need for another transaction so that they can sort of settle things there. And the same thing will happen in that second transaction. And so the, the interaction will continue. And that is the secret uh, of the continuity of communal ties. If you enter into your interaction with others in a way that at the end of interaction, 
you feel that you don't owe anything to each other, then that would be the end of your relationship. So it is good to leave it that, that day. Another, again, interesting thing uh, about this is that for these exchanges to happen, it, they don't have to happen right away. There's a loose time frame here. So I can give you this pen now and I can get this uh, bottle of water tomorrow or many days later. Therefore, uh, we are always in that in-between situation that they think, well, something will happen later on. And therefore, we remain connected. We remain engaged. We remain in that relationship. And that's another reason that these uh, communal relationships do not at end at the end of each transaction. Sometimes uh, we have direct interaction with each other. Sometimes through people, we have interaction, indirect interaction with others. So in a sense, the community can, can grow through all these indirect ties as well. There must be some sort of normative environment uh, that would encourage this kind of uh, transactions for it to sort of be sustainable. A huge, huge, huge uh, factor in all of these, for all of these to happen and uh, to become possible is the element of trust. When you are giving someone something with the hope that another day he or she will return this favor, basically you're trusting that person. You're trusting that he or she knows that he should do something. And you're trusting that whatever time frame uh, that other person uses, eventually something will happen. Because, and that is again, another element that makes us very different from transactions that happen in the market. In the market, you have to have a fully written detailed contract with all the possible scenarios that can go wrong and capture all of them in the contract. Here, we just trust the other part. And if a society or a community uh, experiences a decline in their trust, they have to rely more and more on those kinds of contracts. They have to rely on the legal ways of uh, securing uh, or, or protecting themselves. Uh, and in these transactions, uh, there is a lot of saving that happens. There is a lot of transaction costs that are being saved here because we don't have to go through that sort of long legal route. And at the end, of course, because of all these vague elements that are there, there is a possibility of abuse. There is a possibility of free riding. So this is basically what happens in a communal environment. Now we might we might feel or think that this uh, community is uh, when you go to your family, then you act uh, based on with this kind of operating system. And when you go to the market, when you go to the estate, when you go elsewhere, then you operate with different uh, uh, different operating system. That is true, but not fully, not completely. Uh, this community is present in almost everything that we do, even in the market, even in the uh, in the state realm. Uh, remember, for example, the last elections that you have participated in when we are in the Middle East. I know that elections are not good examples to use for trust. So, uh, uh, but in the election, you basically have to have some sort of trust in a system that will count all these votes the way they should. And uh, even there, in the absence of that trust, then you have to just, everybody has to be just stick around the, the uh, uh, voting booths and, and see what happens to the, to the votes. When you are in the market, if you go to a restaurant and you eat something and then you get the bill at the end, of course, there is a possibility that at the end so that I don't have money and I won't pay. So those guys have trusted you that you will sort of play, uh, play with, the, with the rules of the game. So even those uh, areas are not completely free from these communal elements. But of course, in the community, there is much more of that, uh, all, all of those elements that I mentioned. Robert Putnam, who is an American social scientist at Harvard, has written a book that you might have seen, Bowling Alone. And uh, uh, he was the one that sort of popularized, not necessarily invented, but popularized this notion of uh, social capital. And in these graphs that you see, but probably you cannot read it, which is okay, 
uh, he puts this sort of social capital or, or communal ties as the X axis, and then a whole bunch of social, economic, uh, health indicators as the as the Y axis. So, uh, for example, there, and, and there is and the dots that you see in these graphs are the different states, uh, you know, in, in United States. So you see that there is a positive correlation on the left-hand side. Uh, there is a positive correlation between social capital and the other indicator that is there. And some of these indicators, I'm just, I cannot see it, but I'm just saying by memory that, for example, the state of health uh, or the educational uh, attainment of, uh, of children. Something interesting is that there is a positive correlation between the strength of social capital in a community and the ability of children, very young children, to count. You know, the young children, when you ask them to count from one to five, one to 10, the stronger the social capital, the higher they can uh, count, which is, which is very interesting. Because at that level, at that age, there should not be too much influence of, uh, of society on, on children, but it is, it is there. And on the negative side, on the, on the right hand side, the ones that show a sort of negative correlation are the ones that are related to crime and death and uh, uh, sickness and illness and all, all sorts of things. So there is therefore a correlation between social capital and all these uh, other indicators. Very quickly, this is a map that uh, Robert Putnam uses for the distribution of social capital in different states in, uh, in the United States. Canadians particularly like this map because that basically means that the closer they get to the north to Canadian border, there is a higher level of social capital. So Canadians for no obvious reason are happy about this map. Uh, in, uh, he did another study in Italy and uh, again, he found this kind of different levels of higher level of uh, social capital in the northern parts of Italy and lower in the south, and also found some sort of correspondence between that and the, the health of the democratic traditions in the north and also the strength of the economy. So there was some sort of positive relationship between that communal aspect with both the state functioning, democratic functioning of the state and the functioning of the economy. And uh, my beloved Canada, uh, the distribution of uh, these different indicators of uh, social capital show that there is a huge deficit of social capital in Quebec, that the one that is that large province that is sort of a light gray, that is uh, Quebec. And this is the... the Composite index for for trust, which is I have sort of merged and combined a whole bunch of indicators for trust and sort of created this composite index. And uh, after after Quebec, the one with the province with the lowest level of trust is unfortunately my home province of Alberta, which is on the west. Here. So uh, and and uh, it's interesting that when you look at uh, other indicators, you will see pretty much the same pattern. So this is for the size of the social networks in different provinces. This is for the engagement of population recreational activities like playing soccer or basketball together. And you will see it again in, in Quebec, the level is much lower. This is for uh, uh, volunteering for uh, civic activities, again, much lower in, in Quebec. All right, so that is pretty much the kind of uh, conceptual backdrop of uh, this whole notion of community and why it is important and why uh, we need to pay more, more attention to it. Uh, after this, I will start discussing the situation in Iran. So we can, to, to simplify things, we can think about this whole uh, communal ties and this uh, whole uh, operating system, new operating system that is working in the community uh, as, as two, under, under two sort of uh, broad titles. 
One that we can call the horizontal ties, uh, the kind of connections that uh, tie people, individual people to one another at the, at the societal level, at the level of on the street. And the other one that we can call vertical lines are the ones that are connecting this whole community to the state. So in order to have a healthy state of social capital, both vertical lines and horizontal lines uh, have to be there. Now, if they are not, depending on whether they are present or not, then we can have a combination of these different uh, situations. We can have a strong political trust present with a strong social trust. A strong political trust with weak social trust. We can have all sorts of combinations, at least, at least four. I will come back to this at the end after we look at some of the data, then uh, we'll see where Iran is in terms of these possible combinations. So I'll talk about political trust first and then social trust and the morality and communal trust, which, is, which are all the sort of the concepts that are discussed uh, when this whole issue as community is discussed. In terms of political trust, uh, these are the surveys that uh, we try to find any data that we could for the past 50 years in Iran. And in some cases, we found things that would start 50 years ago and it continues until today. In some cases, we found data for just a portion of that period. So you will see that the, the, the years that are listed uh, at the bottom will change from one graph to another. That's because of the availability of, or inavailability of the data for some of these uh, years. So the level of trust in government officials from 2000, about uh, two to 2017, 18, uh, it has been uh, low and it has gone lower even. Uh, level of trust in judges, and, and this is related to uh, trust in a state uh, because the judges are appointed by the state. There is uh, sort of a, a state-controlled justice system. Uh, there's almost no independence for the justice system. Therefore, the trust in judges uh, is a reflection of the trust in, in the state. Again, that is uh, low and uh, it has been around 40%, and then now it's down to 20%. Now, remember this 20%, because I will have uh, data on other occupations as well, and then we would be able to sort of compare them. Uh, the Whether or not the state is uh, corrupt or uncorrupt, this is the number of people that have uh, felt that this, this uh, the state is uncorrupt has been declining in over the years from something around 50% to the latest, which is about 13, 14%. Uh, whether or not the rule of law is respected in the country or, or enforced by uh, the government, again, it has been uh, relatively low and it has gone even lower. And this is from 96 to 2019. <laughs> Whether government has been successful in the execution of laws, you will see that the highest that we had was around 30%, but 20 years ago. And that was the time that the reformist government, the reformist president was in office and his main mandate and campaign was the rule of law. So that was sort of the highest that it could go. And then uh, <clears throat> by 2018, it has gone down to about, to about 10%. Whether the government values uh, people's opinion and votes, again, the numbers that if you see on the right hand side, the number who agrees uh, has dropped from 50% to 40%. And I just remember that these are, this is the latest data is from 2015. So we are seven years later. And in these seven years, there have been two uprisings that had happened uh, uh, two years ago, four years ago. And then, of course, today, there is still protests going on in Iran. And especially the last one, about two years ago, when that happened, the other information that we have that we couldn't use it in the book 
show that that was a turning point. And almost all of the, the indicators, similar indicators, are showing a huge drop in terms of trusting government after the sort of the uprising two years ago. Which areas uh, the government has been more successful in? Again, these are pretty low. The only one that is, uh, uh, so in, in terms of the providing the for the well-being of the population, respecting law, freedom of speech and press, these are all low. The only one that is showing uh, more than 50% is providing security. And again, that is 2015. And that is at the peak of when Daesh was uh, operating in the area and there were some attacks that happened uh, around the borders of Iran and even inside the Iran. There was an attack uh, on the Iranian parliament at one point. So this fear of Daesh or fear of something like Syria, like uh, Iraq happening in Iran, was the driving force behind these sort of higher numbers. And, and people felt that at least the government has been successful in, and effective in terms of providing this security. Now, using uh, th th those were sort of the main uh, functioning of the direct functioning of the government. These are sort of indirect ones. Using television as the main source of news. Television in Iran is state-run uh, television. Therefore, this is also a reflection of how much trust they have in the government. And you see the numbers have uh, dropped from something in 2006, around 85% to around 50%. Uh, using the print media as a, as the source of news, this has gone down to almost zero, and that is because of the crackdown on the free press and the huge huge restrictions that the government has put on on newspapers and uh, magazines, print media in general, and and on on books. The the book that I'm talking about, when we send it to the publisher, the publisher had to send it to the Ministry of it's called Ershad, the Ministry of uh, uh, Guidance, Islamic Guidance, Culture and Islamic Guidance. And they have a section that will control the books and then give sort of permission. And they said that this cannot be published, so they banned it from, from publication. Then it went to a higher council, a higher council, so it was rejected in all of those. And just recently we have learned that uh, they have allowed it to be published. I think it is a reflection of the other things that they are worried about at the moment. So, uh, so you are you are looking at the pages of a book that hasn't been published yet. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, using the uh, internet as the main source of. Oh, by the way, in this in this past uh, last one, this one, uh, the one on on TV which is around 50% now. There was a report that came out uh, based on a leaked uh, government document, a, a classified report that the intelligence community had uh, prepared for the leader. And they had actually done their own surveys and they uh, reported that number to be 25%. So 25% as of yesterday. Uh, internet around... 30%, and, and in that report, it was saying the same, that the internet usage is around, around that number. So in terms of political trust, the country is not doing very well. In terms of social trust, this is a map of uh, a global sort of distribution of trust in different countries. And you will see at the bottom of the page that, I mean, if this is clear, yeah, these different colors that we have, uh, the more, uh, blue they are, that is a better or higher level of trust, the more in the on the red side, or sort of the more, uh, the lower trust. And you'll see that in this, uh, for, for a long time, the, the Scandinavian countries have been reporting the highest level of trust and uh, China, Australia, and uh, the Netherlands, uh, Switzerland, uh, Canada, and then uh, we have uh, countries in uh, South America that are run by uh, drug uh, rings and drug cartels, and th those are pretty, uh, pretty low in trust. So if you look at Iran, 
Iran is between in that second bottom category. So 10 to 19, and the actual number is 14, 14.9, 14.5%. So 15% is the level of social trust. So, so one category off of the one, the countries that are run by the drug cartels, basically. So, uh, and if you want to find Lebanon on this, can you see what it is for Lebanon? It's the same. It's 10 to, 10 to 20. I am surprised that it should be a one or two. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't have a category for that. They put it in zero to 10. Okay, so good, good that we have these agreements here for this. Then you won't question this. All right. So, what uh, has happened over time? That was that was twenty twenty uh, data. Over time, then the surveys that we have had, and this is the one that for which we have sort of the longest period covered. Uh, in nineteen seventy four, there was a survey that was done in Iran. Nineteen seventy four, four or five. Uh, that survey had the question on trust, and the level of trust was fifty three percent. Another one was done uh, in 98, I believe, and that was again 50%. And, but from then on, it has dropped significantly. And that last red line, red dot that you see for 2020, it was the one that we saw in that map. It's down to 15%. So a huge, huge uh, drop in trust. And, and some of these areas, I don't know whether this cursor, can you see the cursor? No. So, so the uh, nineteen seventy six. If you see after nineteen seventy six, there is there is a peak. That is basically when the revolution happened in nineteen seventy nine. That was the peak of uh, trust, and actually that was the period, a, a golden period for trust in Iran, and that was the time that people were. Well, for those who have lived through that, they have lots of interesting stories to tell. A lot of people wouldn't lock even their doors. A lot of people. Uh, something very unusual that uh, in Iran even today is that a lot of women when they were driving if there was somebody waiting for uh, for a taxi or something they just picked them up and uh, and both were felt, felt comfortable uh, that's a thing because nobody felt that there is any risk involved and uh, uh, yeah lots of lots of stories there that I if I start talking about them I will get emotional I cannot continue the rest of the all right, uh, now the level of trust in different uh, occupations, people in different occupations. The taxi drivers are the ones that have one of the lowest levels of trust because they just arbitrarily change the, the rates. And um, Sari was telling me that if you're going from here to there, don't pay two services, pay one. <laughs> so the same story here. Okay. And um, now that thing that I told you about the judges, uh, and um, I don't know whether we have looked at clergy or not, or it is after this, uh, or it's after this. Twenty percent is for the for the drivers. It has been twenty percent for the judges uh, in the justice system, and this next next one is for the clergyman. So the religious leaders also, because of all the situation that uh, all the things that have happened in these forty some years. Now they have dropped to one of the lowest levels of uh, trust, around 20%. Uh, the most surprising and uh, disappointing news with, with uh, trust levels and trust trends is that there were three groups that were highly trusted for a long time. And every time, uh, if there was sort of a possibility of a social change in Iran, we were hoping that these groups can act as uh, sort of moral references, as moral authorities in the country, and they can, some people might listen to them uh, in those critical moments. And those were physicians, university professors, and uh, high school or primary school teachers. 
these two groups. So this is for, for physicians. It was around 60-70% at one point, and it has dropped to 40%. So they have lost that kind of moral authority status that we were hoping for. Uh, my colleagues, from around 70% to 40%, a significant drop there, and the same for uh, the high school and, and primary school teacher, which was the highest at the beginning of this period, 80% and now down to 40%. How am I doing for time? Okay. Maybe uh, uh, seven minutes more? Seven minutes, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that was the situation with those two types of trust, the <laughs> vertical and the the horizon, the political and the and the social. Now, a couple of other things that are also sort of related to this communal life and are essential for having a healthy communal life is uh, the impact of the morality and the strength of morality in, in society. Because as I mentioned, a lot of the transactions and a lot of the interactions that happen in, in the community they are based on some sort of mutual understanding that people have. And those mutual understanding are based on something. And that something is, is the moral structure, moral foundation of society. And trust is sort of a moral feature as well. So in terms of morality, not, again, a very pretty picture. The percentage of uh, the population who would keep their promises when they make one. Uh, less than 20% has remained like that. Uh, the percentage of people that are willing to help others has been around 30%, has dropped to around 20%. Uh, the percentage of people who are willing to forgive, and that's another thing, the, the forgiveness has, has lost its uh, power. There are a lot of things that uh, happen in our daily lives that if we cannot forgive others, then we won't be able to move on. So uh, this uh, slogan by Nelson Mandela that we won't uh, forget but we forgive, but the wise did blacks in South Africa, that was such a powerful combination, the ability to, to forgive. And they say that well, these days forgiveness has become even more difficult because in order to forgive, you have to forget certain stuff. And now with the social media and with, with the digitization of every single activity and every single thing that we have said, they're all available in front of us. We cannot really ignore anything and therefore it has become harder to forgive. But that ability has declined significantly in Iran. Uh, the percentage of people who think others are fair uh, and are oneself in their dealing with others, the same story. The, the only things that have increased are the percentage of people who think that others are lying frequently, significant jump again. Uh, cheating in their transaction, daily transactions, and uh, nefar or hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Now, I think I can I can finish with this part on on religion. Uh, I mentioned that you're not, I'm not going to sort of focus too much on that political spiritually part, but there is a part of this religious developments that have implications for for the communal life. And uh, as I said, there needs to be some sort of moral foundation, moral access in the community life. And for the longest time, religion was providing that moral foundation and still it is to some extent and even in other societies as well so the more that this uh, religious uh, uh, weight uh, is uh, reduced of course uh, the the moral posture of the society will be weakened as well so membership in religious groups uh, a significant decline, 40 to 20 percent. Uh, whether they have uh, people have practiced their own sort of religious rituals, uh, this is interesting in terms of the daily prayers. The numbers have 
fluctuated a little bit, but they have remained relatively high. So that individual aspect of religiosity uh, has remained on average uh, quite high, although we will see later that for, for the younger generation, it has changed significantly. Uh, whether people fast during Ramazan, uh, the same, almost a, a small decline, but almost uh, stable. Now, these are the parts that these, these were sort of individual aspects of uh, religious practices. Now, there are some parts that are heavily influenced by government. So government controls mosques, government controls any kind of collective activity that is on like Friday, Friday uh, prayers, Salat al Jumma. All of these are the ones that uh, government uh, has a major role in. And because of that role, then people are not just uh, reacting to it as a religious thing. They are reacting to it as a religious slash political thing. So here, the participation in uh, collective prayers, for example. Now, uh, pay attention to that initial point. That initial point was in 1975, before the revolution, four years before the revolution. And it was around 60%. So that's interesting that in a secular state uh, that did all sorts of other things wrong, but at least it touched, it, it left uh, people's uh, religiosity and, and religion alone, except for where they had political implications, 60% were participating in, in uh, collective prayers on a regular basis. This has dropped to around 20 some percent, and in some cases, uh, even 50. Participation in the Friday prayers that are directly regulated by government has just fluctuated between five or 10 to, to 20. Now, uh, I mentioned about the, the youth. These are the, the daily prayer, the rates of daily prayers for younger uh, Iranians. I have used the word value survey to compare uh, four or five different countries, uh, Iran, Turkey, and in some uh, other cases, Egypt was included as well, and US, Canada, UK. Now, when you look at the Iranian youth, the numbers are almost the same as UK, as one of the more secular cases. Turkey, US is high. And when, when I had Egypt in some other graphs, that was the highest that they had. Uh, how often do you go to mosque on a regular basis? Uh, again, for uh, the younger folks, it is it has dropped significantly from around 50% to around 10%. Now this is reflected, it's, uh, this has reflected itself in the kind of people that leave Iran. So these are the immigrants, Iranian immigrants in Canada. There was a study done a few years back that compared these four groups of Muslim uh, immigrants in Canada, Afghans, Iranians, Pakistanis, and Palestinians. In, in Iran and UK and uh, other places. And uh, just look, if you look at the, the right-hand side of this graph, this is showing the percentage of them, proportion of them that uh, seem to be secular. And the numbers for Iranian is around 90%. And this 90% is higher than the British immigrants, higher than the French immigrants even to, to Canada, which is, which is quite amazing. Conclusion. And in conclusion, okay, so let, let me show this one as well and then conclusion. This is also the trends in terms of uh, what people, the names that people choose for uh, their children. This is from 1966 uh, all the way to uh, today. Now, the two lines that you see at the top are the percentage of the names that had either an Arabic origin or an Islam or an Islamic origin. The two ones that you see at the at the middle are the ones that are sort of nationalistic names or Persian origin, like those based on sort of Persian mythology. And the, the one at the bottom is sort of neutral names. 
Now you see that things and, and that red line that you see in the in the middle is when the revolution happened. So in the revolution at that time, the higher the highest proportion of names were sort of the names that there are that are Arabic or Islamic. And you see that that has systematically declined. Mm. Let me show one more thing before conclusion. Uh, the, this is the marriage to divorce ratio, you know, again, from 91. So, so that basically means that uh, at one point in 93, 94, for every 16 marriages that would happen, there is only one divorce. This has declined now to three. So in every, for every three marriages, there is one, one divorce. And this one that is, uh, unfortunately, I have to end with the saddest one here. This is the suicide rate. And again, it is starting from uh, the year after the revolution all the way to uh, a couple of, uh, like four or five years ago. And you see that the jump that has happened, tenfold jump that has happened in the suicide rate. And most of these are younger folks. Most of these are women. Unfortunately. So, in conclusion, if I go back to this uh, table that I started with, so we can have a strong communal ties at the at the horizontal level. We can have a strong sort of vertical ties between community and government. If both of them are are strong, if both uh, are in good condition. We are more likely to get sort of a healthy democracy and a prospering uh, economy. If we have uh, a strong base at the bottom, but not so much connection vertically, what will happen is that either the society is stronger or the government is stronger. When the government is stronger and they are they are able to sort of enforce their their will, they will have dictatorship. If society gets stronger, then we'll have a revolution. So these are the two likely scenarios in this kind of uh, composition. When the horizontal connections are weak, but the vertical connection is strong, this is more like a whole bunch of individual people that are connected to a leader. And that is basically the kind of scenario that they have in populist uh, movements. There is not a lot of sort of horizontal connections that people uh, that connect people to one another but there are strong loyalty to a, to a leader and in those kind of uh, situations we get if we get uh, a democratic situation it is a democratic situation because representing majority but it will be dictatorship because there is almost no room for sort of uh, accommodating the minorities because there is not a whole bunch, bunch of connections there and in the last one, when both of them are weak, we most likely have a continuous crisis when the, when the state is still powerful enough to continue. And when that gets weaker, when the state gets weaker, we won't have a revolution because the society also is not strong enough. What is most likely to happen is some kind of chaos, some kind of disintegration, some kind sort of collapse of society, not just collapse of the political system. And unfortunately, uh, what I see in Iran is corresponding mostly with this last scenario. So it's it's a society that is a result of this last 40, 50 years uh, of policies and, and uh, actions and decisions by the government mostly. Uh, has has lost its communal strength, and therefore, even a revolution is not a very likely scenario. Revolution, in the sense of su successful revolution, it might the movement can manage to sort of topple a government, but it cannot replace it successfully in the way that it happened in 1970. So I finish with this one. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much. Uh... So, there is a move. 
um, I think uh, uh, really uh, you you give us a, a kind of a landscape uh, between uh, political trust and uh, social trust. Uh, a lot of things uh, to think about it, but it's a situation is is really alarming and. While you are talking about Iran, I'm, I was thinking about Lebanon and whether uh, really uh, this is uh, here. Uh, I will open the, uh, the floor for uh, discussion. Maybe we will collect uh, two, three questions and then, uh, uh, yeah, we will reply. So uh, anyone would like? Uh, yeah, Aya, please. Uh, I should remove this. Um, yeah. The question is more for my curiosity here. Something caught my attention is um, in the graph that shows the decline in Arab Muslim names and rise in Persian names. How pleasant is the trend of wanting to return to Persian? Like I've heard in some media here in Jamaica and some other other that the Arabians don't like the Arabs much and there's a lot of this Persian in them. And I find them fascinating because even the the Bachla, it's almost more ancient and I'm really interested in that. And is that something they long back for? Because we keep talking in Lebanon about the good old days of Lebanon, Uris Isra, and Uric Sutilan in the Middle East, and it was good, and it was good. So is there that aspect in, in Iran? Mm -hmm. Which we should be uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh perhaps. Um, um, yeah, I was fascinated by um, the uh, graph that showed the suicide rates like beginning to decline in 91. I was just wondering what could have caused uh, really kind of a uh, heat between uh, like hopelessness um, uh, amongst people to get to the suicide rate. So, yeah, what is really cool from that? Waiting for the uh, 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 go ahead. I, I Professor Hassan. Uh, the uh, uh, the Sufian uh, model, uh, and I don't understand why you don't put the church or the equivalent uh, of the church in this model. In In that. You are considering only the community, the state, and the market, and not the church. Or the equivalent. Um, also, I have, uh, I mean, did you, have you done any class, social class analysis? This is really uh, intrigued me. Uh, because uh, you talk about uh, about social trust in in Iran, and we know that this uh, disparities between Tehran, for instance, as a capital, and the rural uh, uh, Iran, and things like that. And uh, when you talk about uh, this uh, weakness of uh, community ties, where is the family uh, here? And. Uh, Professor Birgit Schibler, she she is interested in uh, in neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Would would uh, I would imagine that she will ask uh, uh, whether, among, yeah, among other things, where where is I mean how how you dis disentangle this uh, uh, this community things? I mean, okay, right. Uh, uh... About the the return to sort of the pre-Islamic heritage, you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, there is this sort of what we call it in sociology, a reactive nationalism among Iranians. And uh, because of the way that uh, the government has and, and their sort of discourses have uh, try to undermine the pre-Islamic period, and, and not just the pre-Islamic period, the pre-Islamic period. There are, there are actually three uh, contributors to the Iranian culture and identity at the moment. So one is the pre-Islamic uh, heritage, one is the Islamic heritage, one is the modern Western 
hydrogen. So the government has tried uh, uh, really hard to undermine the pre-Islamic one and the modern one in favor of the Islamic one. And that has created a backlash. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they have associated that, accompanied that with their own brutal dictatorship. And of course, when people are reacting to this dictatorship, they react to whatever comes uh, in a package. It is not that in uh, social movements, people are in a position that they can so, sort of separate these uh, very sort of uh, nicely and then react to one of them and not the other one. So they react to a package. And that package has made, uh, unfortunately, Iranians among the most racist nations that I can find, even in, especially in the communities of Iranians that are living outside the country, because as you've noticed, these are the most secular ones as well. So uh, anti-Arabism is among them. Anti-Islam, uh, they are. Anti-Muslim, they are. Anti-Afghans. Mm -hmm. They are. So uh, they are just uh, trying to sort of find a reference point in a distant past mm -hmm. that even that distant past is not uh, what that past was. So some sort of glorified, uh, selective, uh, imagined past is becoming sort of the compass, the moral compass for it. And so, so that is very real, unfortunately. You might have heard uh, on the news that in some cases, not in this time, but the last time, uh, one of the, the slogans that people had was that uh, not Gaza, not Lebanon, yeah. my life is for Iran. Yeah. So, and, and that is not just a random slogan there. It is widespread there. Uh, and among some, some intellectuals, some poets, they are just contributing to the sort of uh, anti everyone sentiments mm -hmm. uh, sentiments pretty much so no you're you're absolutely right but but like i said this is a reactive nationalism mm -hmm. so with the, the change of situation i'm sure that uh, things will start changing as well in terms of uh, the suicide rates uh you're familiar with the with Durkheim's theory of of suicide probably so he was the first sociologist who did a sort of a systematic study of suicide rates in Europe back in a century ago almost. And uh, what he said was that there are two forces that protect us against, or protect a society against suicide, not the individual society. One is uh, the level of integration and solidarity that people have among uh, themselves. And the other one, the ability of society to regulate uh, or life. So integration and regulation. And regulating means sort of providing some sort of structure so that every morning when we wake up, we do not ask ourselves, what should I do today? So there is some sort of routine, some sort of a structure there. And unfortunately, in Iran, both of these have been weakened over the past 40 years. Uh, so the integration, uh, as I mentioned, this sort of communal decline that has happened basically means that uh, the, the level of integration and solidarity has been much lower, is much lower now. And because of all the fragmentation that has happened in society and the polarization that has happened, society is not able to uh, regulate the lives of its, its members. So it is only normal and, and expected to sort of see this kind of uh, rise in not only suicide rates, because even Durkheim, when he did his suicide study, he used suicide as an indicator of the unhappiness of the society. So the level of unhappiness is so high and therefore the level of suicide as well. Uh, in terms of where is uh, religion in that uh, triangle? Religion has in Iran this sort of funny situation because if, uh, if we were looking at the pre-revolutionary period, uh, religion had no place in the state apparatus. Religion would have been a part of the community. And it was exactly like that. So uh, people relied on religion and religious establishment and all the infrastructure that came with religion in their fight against, against the state. After the revolution, of course, there has been this merging of church and state. So church has joined the state, but not completely. 
half of it, part of it, has gone to the state. The other half has remained in the community. So now church is uh, both part of the community and part of the, the state as well. So in that triangle, I would put it now, I would put it more on the state side than on the community side. I, I think because of this sort of uh, the sentiments that we were talking about, this negative uh, reaction to religion and this uh, running away from religion that is happening, especially among the youth, the religious authorities have, have realized that this alignment that they had with the government was not necessarily a good thing for religion, at least some of them. Some of them are just so corrupt that they have decided that we'll side with the, with the government regardless of the consequences for religion. So religion is not their concern anymore. But those traditional... Uh, religious authorities that they still think uh, about the conventional uh, way of uh, sort of religious institutions, they are beginning to s distinguish themselves from the from the government, but not so successful because the resources, the money, the power, the uh, propaganda machinery, all of them are on the side of the the state uh, the affiliated uh, religion. So I would say that religion in Iran at the moment, if I if we didn't want to have a very sort of detailed picture, I would put it on the on the uh, state side than in the community. So it has lost its significance to do uh, sort of to do the same role as it did during the revolution. Religion is not really a major social factor at the moment. Can you extend this about the veil, the 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 issue? I mean, now current crisis and. <clears throat> In Iran? Uh, now, this is a very interesting manifestation of this situation. The whole issue of hijab in Iran uh, was so that there was a portion of the population that um, observed hijab and observed it as a sort of personal choice. There were those who, of course, had to do it in the public uh, spaces because of the government regulations. Now, what is interesting is that the, the second uh, group, suffers from so much, so many disadvantages and so much pressure that, of course, all these reactions that we see on the streets are the result of that. Now, that first part has started to also take off their hijabs in solidarity with the uh, with the younger uh, women that have to sort of had to deal, had to live with this imposed hijab. So, so it is interesting that now we see more and more people that believe in hijab and they were just uh, observing it until two months ago and they are just going on the social media and declare their distancing from, from hijab as a sign of, uh, if not solidarity with this movement, at least distancing themselves from the government. So it has become a political tool for everyone uh, involved. It is not easy to for people to uh, go on with the sort of old conventional uh, argument that this is my personal choice. It, they have they have done something that it has made it a public issue rather than a personal choice. We have uh, Amr. Amr, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you a lot. Yeah. Can you hear me well, right? You hear me well? Yeah. Okay. I just want to say, like, the most important critiques that were um, kind of discussed towards Putnam, like, kind of concept to social capital, that is basically social capital in his kind of way of understanding. And so that can, can, can be influenced largely by external uh, conditions and unpredictable also uh, reasons and so on like like international uh, uh, interference or like uh, corruptions or un unpredictable conditions and so on and and also like i don't know in based on yeah, sari's like last last sentence i just want to understand how how you would see social capital today in in the current kind of movement how how you would see maybe um uh I mean, greater change or major changes in the uh, uh, areas that you analyze comparing to, to the previous period. And if there any in the current movement, do you think there is any uh, correlation or uh, to the green movement per se, or this is or if this movement that we're witnessing today and we 
uh, seeing today is different in, in in its nature, and if it's showing like kind of any um, also changes when it comes to the individual themselves uh, between religious and and community, we seeing today there is a kind of also revolution against religious symbols or 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 or, or so in Iran. So um, how how the social capital understanding would be different today in in the yeah, in the light of the yeah current movement. Professor Shibler. Thank you. Um, Can you use the microphone, please? Yeah. 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 yeah thank you very much. Um, I, I would have three three questions. Um, the first is, could you could you limit the first part, right? When you talked about uh, when you gave us the quotes about about um, about the revolution. So people may have been also Marxist, Leninist, and of course the, the other the other two, and then uh, and the the mild socialist version and the fruitful version. Could you move that part with the last part with the conclusion? Because I'm not quite sure where you want to go with this. Mm -hmm. Um and the second is an observation on on, on the suicide issue because I'm not sure that Durkheim really fits there. Because if I'm not mistaken, Durkheim's cases were mostly male, and the issue raised by solidarity kind of seems to lead to that. And now you said, and I found that very interesting, that the majority of those high rates of suicides in in Iran were female, and now we see this female revolution, right? So isn't there the despair and the, 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 the moral, I mean, the pressure that is being put on women, not only the hijab, I mean, the pressure in general that women are being put under in Iran, religious ones who don't mind the hijab and other ones. I found that very interesting. I don't mean not to have this question. So could you maybe link that? Because I think that there is a connection here, right? So that, that, that seems to me that the level of despair among women is so much higher now, and then at some point this is kind of like exploded. And and the other thing is sort of following up on what Sari said, I was also struck that you know for the community you only gave us the example of the family. And the community, of course, this is um and the, you know that I was wondering why you only gave us uh, the example of the family because in the family you have you know another term of what you describe as the communism of love, right? So everybody uh, exploits uh, sort of uh, him or herself for for the others and doesn't keep up the best faces and doesn't really want to be remunerated. But then when you come to the other levels of society, be it the neighborhood, which is there's no communism of love anymore, and on the you know, it's a, higher levels of the nation. All the theories of nationalism tell us that, of course, there is a link between these people. Um, who think that they reform the nation, but there is definitely not, you know, not, not the sign of the kind of uh, solidarity, love, care that you have in the family. So I was wondering um, what you would make with this. And why you didn't give us the others? Now you mentioned the family and the neighborhood and the nation, but it seemed to be conflated a little bit under the uh, under the care of the family, which I couldn't see. Uh, Aya, last question. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Hassan. Okay. Oh, Go ahead, Aya. Okay. No. Um, well, because um, I've had relatives in Iran since I was very young, and we always have several anecdotes. And now, when you said about the not of one of radio, and the link that racism, does it not also have something to do with because they would the taxi drivers would tell my relatives, um, you're taking all our money and never don't, and no one asked for their and then to buy them. And obviously, they're talking about the color. And isn't this a major leak of government money that could be going to Iranian people that is not going to Iranian people that makes the Iranians possibly dislike? us Arabs and also you said can spend out a big source of money from Iran goes to there and Afghanistan also like your fighters in Syria etc. So how how important is Kimbana in this for the uh, uh, Iranian people's feelings about us? Thank you Aya. So uh, my uh, my question is uh, about uh, the evolution of the Iranian society towards uh, a weak social trust and weak political trust. 
And uh, this evolution, uh, I mean, uh, when we were talking about this, I was also like uh, society thinking about the defense society that is also moving or <laughs> evolving uh, toward this uh, uh, situation. And my question is, uh, uh, do you think that uh, this evolution that you uh, talked about is specific to Iran? And uh, uh, or specific to this uh, region, uh, what, what is it called? Because the, 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 the Lebanese society is so different from the Iranian uh, society. So, why those both societies are moving toward this situation of crisis, in fact, uh, uh, toward chaos? And, and, and eventually, I mean, the Lebanese society uh, is in advance on this, uh, on, on, on this side. And whether uh, also it has a global dimension, perhaps. I mean, the, you know, the rest of the world also is moving toward the system. Right, great. Uh, so let me see if I can answer in the order that they were asked. About the situation of uh, community discriminational decline and, and social capital decline and the current situation. And, and uh, if I didn't understand your question fully. Please uh, push me a little further on that. Uh, that's in reference to the question that was asked. Uh, 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 Amr. Amr. So uh, uh, the uh, when when we were discussing this uh, issue in Iran, a critic that came uh, in the past two months. Uh, that this sort of protests were happening was that, okay, so the community was on decline and um, now everything has been reversed. Now we have a social movement and therefore the community has expressed itself and it is sort of restoring itself. Uh, my answer was that not necessarily. So a social movement can provide an opportunity for the community to restore itself, but it provides an opportunity. It doesn't automatically do it. So it is quite possible that, especially in this day and age, with the social media uh, present everywhere, it's quite possible to have uh, people responding to a call for demonstration, receiving that call individually, responding to it individually, taking this making decision individually participating in demonstration individually and then coming back home. so there is no social element in this action it is collective but it is not social necessary social means there has to be some sort of collective decision making and interaction among people so in the same way that uh, for example the example of collective prayers collective prayers yes they are collective in the sense that there is a crowd that is there but this is a lonely crowd because they all come individually and they go and they don't have much interaction amongst themselves. So social movement, because it allows society to develop a different operating system, different value system, allows them, uh, actually gives the opportunity to restore the social capital, but that requires some sort of moral entrepreneurship. That requires people that know that this is an issue and pay attention to it and try to restore it. If not, it will just reinforce the fragmentation that is there. And this is exactly what is happening in Iran. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of people that were okay to work with each other before, as a result of the social movement and the fragmentation and the polarization that has happened, are now unable to work with each other. So in a sense, the community has uh, declined even further despite the fact that the social movement has been going on. So my, my short answer is that, uh, no, it hasn't, the, the social movement that is going on, it hasn't improved the situation of social capital. It has provided an opportunity, but with the lack of awareness and lack, lack of attention and lack of initiatives uh, on this, I don't think that this opportunity will be taken advantage of. So, uh, and that's why I think, uh, it is much more likely for the society to disintegrate and, and fall into disintegration rather than going through a, a revolutionary path. In terms of the questions on suicide and uh, 
also the connection between those those initial uh, uh, quotes and and the final conclusion. I think uh, uh, it's, there's no sort of straight ways lines that I can draw between those uh, initial uh, statements and this uh, sort of final uh, picture. But uh, this is what what I can I can say. Uh, Almost all three of those statements that I mentioned, the one by Omani Taylor and also almost all of them were correct at the same time. So those who felt that this was an uh, an authentic anti-imperialist, anti-colonial movement, they were correct, and that was happening. Those who felt that this has a potential uh for dictatorship and especially uh, uh, the target of that uh, dictatorship would be women, those were correct as well. And Foucault also was, was correct that this was a very unique development and that the whole idea of political spirituality that, that he mentioned and the whole idea of the unity and solidarity that happened in Iran, that was quite unprecedented as well. What I think uh, uh, happened was that uh, there were all those different uh, forces that were competing uh, with different visions for the future of uh, Iranian society after the revolution. The progressive forces, th this was not something that we were not aware of, this, all, all these potential dangers and risks or the dictatorship potential. Uh, these were not something that we were not aware of, but uh, the progressive, more liberal uh, camp simply got defeated in the course of the post-revolutionary developments. And one thing that contributed to that significantly was the uh, Iran-Iraq war. So when uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Iran and, and occupied that seven Western provinces of the country, we were at the heat of a political struggle for this future vision of Iran. And that changed everything. When, when that war was happening, either voluntarily some political forces uh, and opposition forces said that, well, something bigger is happening here, something bigger, the whole country is, the, the future of the whole country is at stake, and therefore we should not push for those reforms. Or government very cleverly used that as an excuse in order to uh, suppress all the opposition. So what I'm saying is that all these different trends and all those different uh, potentials that were mentioned in the, those statements were all real and present, but in the course of what happened after the revolution, and especially this impact of the of the war, uh, the, the more progressive forces got uh, got defeated. In terms of the suicide rates, yes, that is actually an interesting. Uh, the Dorcam is still help, uh, hopeful, helpful uh, in terms of the link between this regulation and, and integration and the suicide rates. But of course, I'm, I'm not using that in a very dogmatic way. I'm just using uh, this as a conceptual framework that would point me to certain elements to pay attention to. Uh, and, and I think what has happened is that, uh, and this could be an addition to uh, Durkheim's perspective, that uh, the situation of women in Iran was a very unique one because uh, it was not just all oppression. Mm -hmm. It was a whole bunch of opportunities that were provided to women as well, and not necessarily for the right reasons, sometimes for the wrong reasons. I tell many, and I have brought, uh, mentioned that in my book, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini was very opposed to women's voting rights uh, back in 1962-63. And he actually wrote a letter to Shah of Iran at the time, said that we have heard that you are trying to change the election law, and this is one of the items that you want to change, and we are totally opposed to that. All the ulama in uh, the seminaries are, are uh, against this. And uh, then after the revolution, a lot of those ulama came to him and said that, okay, this is what you said, and we should enforce it. And he said, no. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, no, 
for the reason that, and actually his statement was that this is against Islam if you if you pursue this. One reason was that because of the participation of women in the revolutionary movement, he needed that that support. He needed that participation, and in order to keep that alive, he had to make some concessions. So basically, some uh, opportunities were provided for men, and as a result of that, the level of education, the level of uh, enrollment in universities, all of these went uh, went higher, not necessarily in occupation. And that created more expectation for women, but of course the uh, opportunities were not there. So, so in a sense, it created some sort of relative deprivation uh, scenario, and that's why we see the uh, sort of the kind of anger and frustration on the part of women. Another factor, another twist in the situation is after 19, uh, 2009 uh, election, that controversial election that Ahmadinejad got elected for the second time. I think that was also a poor turning point because. Uh, the participation of women in those demonstrations, I think, gave uh, the government the signal that there is no way that they can keep women on their side. Mm -hmm. So they gave up that whole idea. And all those initial concessions that they had made and all the reforms that they had made and all the sort of facilitation of women's participation in social, uh, to engage socially, they just decided to remove all of those and go back to their base and, and their base was that 20% almost of very traditional uh, re religious people that were against all of these measures, all of these uh, opportunities that women had. So in a sense, there was sort of a reverse uh, movement, even on the part of the government in terms of uh, the situation for, for women. And I think those are the factors that contributed to this higher level of suicide among, among women in Iran. And this is something that can be uh, added to uh, all those other elements that uh, we can get from the Durkheimian uh, analysis. In terms of family as an uh, example of community or uh, social capital, no, it, I was just using that example as something that people can more easily relate to, but I agree with you that fam social capital or, or community, it shows itself in so many different uh, ways and in and, and the book we have uh, talked about all of these the sort of associational life for example the volunteering the uh, donation all of those uh, aspects that pretty much uh, Patnam talks about all of them in uh, his his bowling alone but that was sort of the most concrete example that people can immediately relate to. Uh, in terms of the resources that what have gone from Iran to Iran. Yes, that is that is part of this thinking and this sentiments. And they are very upset and angry. A lot of Iranians, all these sort of reactive nationalists, that any resources are being spent on uh, anyone other than Iran. But that is not really about money. It is more the symbolic meaning of that that is triggering this sort of anger among them. Because they know that the amount of money is not uh, huge. They know that there are some strategic consideration behind that the spending as well. It's not just out of the goodness of the heart of the, the Iranian rulers. All of a sudden, they care about the Lebanese, but they don't care about the Iranians. It's, it's, they know that there is a strategic consideration there. But the, the frustration and the level of anger is so high that it doesn't allow for even the minimal level of rationality or, or, or sort of straight thinking about this so that is that is mentioned in the uh in the in the slogans that are there and lastly about the situation in lebanon being so, somewhat similar i think there is a, that global trend is trend that is happening almost globally and in the examples that are used in the uh, US, in the uh, UK, in France especially, is a huge decline of social capital that has happened there. But uh, besides that or underneath that, there are things that are contributing to that low capitalism. Okay, thank you so much uh, uh, for this wonderful talk, really uh, enlightening about what is going on in Iran and uh, 
theoretical uh, framework uh, that you provide in the beginning, I think, let us think so what other countries uh, we are uh, or are interested in. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, your attendance. Awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. What's that? Your book, what's that? <laughs> I'm I'm in negotiation. <laughs>